So once again, you're here joining us for Common Sentence Errors. Uh, we're the right site and we're so happy to have you here. So before we can talk about sentence errors, let's review what a sentence is. This seems a little bit simplistic, but it's not. It's important. It's the foundation of understanding, identifying and correcting errors. A sentence is made up of three things. A subject, a verb, and an object. And sometimes you go a little bit beyond that to a complete thought. And then there's that period there at the end. So you might have heard the verb and object called the predicate. I like to keep it a little bit simpler and use verb to remember that's an action. So some kind of action needs to be done in the sentence. And then subject and object, those are opposing things. So I find that easier to remember. Subject, verb, object. We'll come back to that as well. The SVO of subject, verb, object. A subject is someone or something who is doing an action, the verb, or sometimes there's a type of verb like is that allows the subject to be described. So there's two types of sentences, two different types of verbs, but it amounts to the same thing. We have someone doing an action or being described, and the object is what the action is directed towards. Or it could be the description of the subject, as in, I am hungry. There's some more technical terms for what uh, hungry would be in that sentence, but you can just think of it in that simple way, subject, verb, object. If more information is needed, you might complete the thought and then put the period. But the three main things that are needed are SVO, subject, verb, object. So a complete sentence is also called an independent clause. So any independent clause, it's independent, it can stand on its own, has SVO. An incomplete sentence uh, is a dependent clause, also known as a subordinate clause. It's dependent. So it needs to be connected to an independent clause in order to be complete. So we'll see these in some types of errors that come along later. We'll have to remember what a complete sentence is and what an incomplete sentence is. So to build on that, let's talk about types of sentences. Now, I've given a little check mark here just because simple sentences are a really good place to start. If you find that you have a lot of sentence errors, um, dialing it back and just using simple sentences to start uh, can be a really good um, building block to begin. So a simple sentence is one independent clause like I like lemon sorbet. We have a subject, I, we have a verb, like, and we have an object, lemon sorbet. So a simple sentence is a subject, verb, and object, or SVO, as I hinted at earlier. A compound sentence is when you start to join simple sentences together, or remember a sentence, a complete sentence that's simple is also an independent clause. It can stand by itself as a sentence. So when you create a compound sentence, it's made up of two or more <laughs> independent clauses. They'll also be closely related. You will only want to join them if it makes sense logically to join them. So one way that you can join them correctly is with a semicolon like you see here. I like lemon sorbet, semicolon, she prefers vanilla ice cream. And if you speak this out loud, it might only be a quick pause, but the semicolon is stronger than a comma, and that's why you can join two complete sentences together. I think of it as a little bit of a longer pause. 
So let's break this down. The compound sentence is SVO, I like lemon sorbet, semicolon, SVO, she prefers vanilla ice cream. I is the subject, like is the verb, lemon sorbet is the object, semicolon, she is the subject, prefers is the verb, vanilla ice cream is the object. And of course, there's that period at the end. Now, there's another way to join two sentences together into a compound sentence. You can join them with a comma, but not only a comma, that will be an error we'll see, a comma and a coordinating conjunction. What's a coordinating conjunction? Well, here's an easy way to remember. It's a fanboy. <laughs> So all of the coordinating conjunctions can be remembered through this acronym, FANBOYS. For, and, nor, but, or, yet, so. So go team. You can use a coordinating conjunction or FANBOY along with a comma to join two sentences together. Like this. I like lemon sorbet, comma, but she prefers vanilla ice cream. But is the B in fanboys. So to break down this sentence, we have SVO, subject verb object, a comma, a fanboy for coordinating conjunction, and SVO again. So you can see in this breakdown here how it's two complete sentences, two independent clauses joined in a correct way. So moving on to complex sentences. Here's where we get those dependent clauses that we were talking about earlier. Um, so we've got an independent clause. It's a complete sentence on its own. Um, but what about adding a thought that's dependent on it? You can do that by using a subordinating conjunction. Now that's just, you don't need to know that. Fanboys, remember fanboys? Now we have I saw a wobbub. Now, this isn't all of the subordinating conjunctions. There are many, many, but these are mm, eight or nine of the top used subordinating conjunctions. And this is a really good way to remember what a subordinating conjunction is, to have that sense of, okay, is this the type of word that's going to create a dependent clause? Because if it is, it needs to be joined to an independent clause to create a complete sentence. Otherwise, it'll be incomplete. So if, since, as, when, although, while, after, before, until, and because. I saw a wabub. <laughs> so let's put some of them to use. I like lemon sorbet because it is very refreshing. So we've got an independent clause and then a dependent clause beginning with a subordinating conjunction or a wabba. Because it is very really refreshing, I like lemon sorbet. We've got a dependent clause beginning with a wabba and then our independent clause. And that breaks down in this way. So the first one, SVO, wabba, SVO. Or wabub, SVO, comma, SVO. So just a little note here that if the dependent clause comes before the independent clause, you'll place a comma uh, at the end of the dependent clause. Whereas there's no comma if the dependent clause comes second. All right, so to finish up our sentence structure discussion, uh, we'll talk about compound complex. So now we're joining compound, which is at least two independent clauses, complex, at least one dependent clause. So independent clause plus independent clauses plus dependent clauses. <laughs> the sentences really can go on for a while and still be grammatically correct, but they could also be hard to follow. So we try to put a limit on it. So see if you can figure out 
this first one. What are the different elements that create this, um, this sentence? Remember, we have SVOs, which are independent clauses. We have coordinating conjunctions. We have wabubs. We have semicolons. We have commas. Do you think you can write in the chat how this first sentence is broken down? Just kind of as we've seen these breakdowns here. And I'm just going to come back to the chat. See if anybody has any suggestions. Can you still see the screen there? The, the slides? Yes, we can. OK, thanks, Tina. Thanks, Diane. Well, it's tough, so why don't I get you started? I like lemon sorbet. That's SVO. What would come after the SVO? SVO. And next we see a punctuation mark. Comma and fanboy. Yep, yeah, that's right, Trish. So comma, fanboy. Then we have another SVO. What's if? You remember what if is? Okay, getting some good answers here. Uh, okay, Joanne said SVO, comma, fanboy, SVO, wabub, SVO. And yes, um, if is a wabub. Okay, so you're right. Let's take a look. SVO, comma, fanboy, SVO, wabub, SVO. So an interesting thing about dependent clauses is that um, they include a subject verb object, but it's not the main subject verb object of the sentence because it's subordinated by the wabub. The wabub makes that clause dependent. So if this sentence just said, if she has a choice, it would be incomplete. What if she has a choice? There's a question. So it's not a complete thought. All right, let's take a look at this compound complex sentence. Because I like lemon sorbet, it was all I had. But she prefers vanilla ice cream. Because is our wabub. And the wabub will almost always be followed by the SVO. Subject, verb, object, a comma, because the dependent clause is coming first. Then our independent clause, subject, verb, object, a comma and a fanboy, and another independent clause, subject, verb, object. I guess I had too many in that one. And this one, lemon sorbet rocks my world. That's an independent clause, doesn't have a wabba before it, so it's independent. And although it will always rock my world, this is dependent because it has a wabba. Now another independent. I wonder how you feel about it. That's the biggest difference between independent and dependent is that a dependent clause will begin with something that subordinates it, makes it dependent on another sentence or another independent clause. So we have subject, verb, object, comma, fanboy, a wubba, subject, verb, object, comma, subject, verb, object. And I'm sorry, I gave extras there as well. You don't have to put long lines at the end of your sentences. These are just different ways that you can combine um, compound and complex sentences, different ways that you can combine 
independent and dependent clauses. But remember that check mark that I gave on the simple sentences? If you find you have sentence errors, or if this seems a little bit too complicated, start with simple sentences, just subject, verb, object, period. Subject, verb, object, period. And then after you can go back and combine them in grammatically correct ways, the ones we've been seeing, a comma and a coordinating conjunction, a semicolon. Um, you may want to subordinate a clause to show the relationship that it has with another clause when you join them. So begin with simple, and then you can build up to this. So before we go on to types of errors, are any questions coming up about sentence types? Or sentence structure in general? Just looking in the chat here. OK, so Shireen asked a really good question. Does wabub mean dependent? Yes, a wabub begins a dependent clause. That's right. Um, the wabub will always subordinate the subject, verb, and object that come after it to another uh, independent clause. And so another way of thinking of this is that an independent clause is usually the more important information in a sentence. You want to subordinate the information that's less important. So you might use a wabub to do that. Um, so let's see, just looking at one of our examples. Because I like lemon sorbet, it was all I had but she prefers vanilla ice cream. So I'm just imagining, got a friend over, she doesn't like lemon sorbet, that's all I have. She wants vanilla ice cream. Guess she's gonna have to order skip the dishes ice cream or something. I don't know if it can get there that fast without melting. The because I like lemon sorbet is less important than it was all I had and she prefers vanilla ice cream. That's where the drama is happening, right? It's just kind of to the side that I like lemon sorbet. And the because, the wabub shows the relationship between the two clauses. It was all I had because I like it. I don't have things that I don't like. <laughs> have what I like. Um, so you also use those wabubs to show relationships. Um, but at the same time, you use it to subordinate that less important information to the more important information. And so, yes, once again, the wabub makes the clause dependent. So the subject, verb, and object that come after the wabub are always going to be dependent on another clause. Um, yes, Jennifer, a dependent clause will have a wabub and a subject verb object. And Joanne said that's so much clearer to understand that a dependent clause actually needs another clause. All right, so Shireen asks, next question, what is independent? So an independent clause does not have a subordinating word in front of it. Um, it could have a transition word like however in front of it that acts differently, that doesn't subordinate the information, that transitions the information. It could potentially, not usually in formal writing, but it could have a fanboy in front of it, like and comma, this, 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 can you believe it? Um, that doesn't subordinate it either that transitions it from the previous sentence. It's that it's got a main subject, verb, and object with no subordinating uh, word in front of it, no wabub in front of it. 
hope that explains it. Um, let's look at one more example before we go on. Go back to the I like lemon sorbet, because that's an independent clause. If we cross off the rest, just look at I like lemon sorbet, period. That's a simple sentence, and it has the three components. Subject, verb, object. I am doing something or being described. Like, that's the action. And lemon sorbet, the action is done to the lemon sorbet. So that's what makes an independent clause. We'll be able to discuss this lots more as we go through to our types of errors. Um, great questions, so please keep them coming. Um, and Tunda, I can't see the clock today in the way I have this set up. Can you can you please just help me stay on track and let me know maybe at like half an hour and 45 minutes, please? We're almost there. Maybe, almost at um, half an hour? Half an hour plus six minutes. OK, thanks. All right, so our first error is a coordination error. Um, the way that you can think of this is just that different elements like clauses in the sentence um, have the same, that they're equal. You want them to be equal in some way. And you can use um, the conjunctions that we've been seeing, like the fanboys, uh, to show their uh, equity between them. So I'm going to show some examples. So here's an error with coordination. Computers were first introduced to the office environment in the late 60s, and they're less expensive now than they were then. It's just a little bit illogical to jump to now from the late 60s, so this could be reworded. Computers were first introduced to the office environment in the late 60s, and they have since become an integral part of office routine. So the since allows you to have a more logical coordination moving from the late 60s through all that time to now instead of jumping from then to now. Overuse of coordination can also be a problem. At times, a series of less complex sentences is best, and this is especially the case when you may want to make each idea or detail stand out is equally important, but at most times, however, you'll want to make one idea stand out. <laughs> so let's split that up. And that's what I was saying earlier. The sentence can keep going, but it's overused and the sentence will become hard to follow. So at times, a series of less complex sentences is best. And this is especially the case when you may want to make each idea or detail stand out as equally important, period. At most times, however, you'll want to make one idea stand out and to present that idea along with secondary details. So this example is actually telling us something as well that um, you can split up sentences that have different ideas. Try to keep ideas separate so that you don't get uh, an overrun of coordinating ideas that maybe shouldn't be equal. You want to split them up. We'll see some more specific examples of this in parallelism. So parallelism is the balancing or grammatically consistent arrangement of elements in a sentence. Um, so it's really common in lists and comparisons because you either got you know, two or more things, or you've got to list or two or more things to compare. So the example that's incorrect, she enjoys books, jogging, and to swim. Grammatically, we want them all to match. She enjoys reading, jogging, and swimming. Some more examples. So again, with coordinate elements, she found herself out of love, with no money, and having no luck. Well, you can make this sentence flow a lot more smoothly. She found herself out of love, out of funds, and out of luck. Now it's parallel. Watch out for comparison errors with than or as. A laborer's salary is as difficult to earn as a lawyer. 
correct is a laborer's salary is as difficult to earn as a lawyer's. So the two elements there need to be parallel. Uh, with correlative conjunctions, that's like if you say not only, but also, either, dot, 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 or. He not only felt sorry for her, but also was feeling sorry for himself. Let's bring that into parallel. He felt so sorry not only for her, but also for himself. For her, for himself. Or he not only felt sorry for her, but also for himself. For her, for himself. It becomes parallel. More detail on some comparison errors. So when you're comparing, you're describing similarities or differences between two or more things. So you might use like, we saw as and than, um, more or less. You can have equal, her smile is as bright as the sun. Uh, comparative shows a difference, his house is bigger than mine. And superlative shows the greatest dis difference. This is the most delicious cake I have ever tasted. Now, if you complete your comparison, it could look like this. Many people eat margarine because they think it's healthier. Healthier than what? Many people eat margarine because they think it's healthier than butter. An illogical comparison could sound like the new committee's approach is more value-driven than their predecessors. This is similar to one we saw earlier. The new committee's approach is more value-driven value than their predecessors, as in their predecessors' approach. We need committee's approach and predecessors' approach to uh, be equal there in parallel. Again, grammatically incomplete, the Trans-Canada Highway is longer than any Canadian highway. Is it longer than itself? The Trans-Canada Highway is longer than any other Canadian highway. And when it comes to um, quality or quantity, that could be illogical. He had more good marks this term than last, or he had better marks this term than last. That rose is the beautifulest I've seen. That rose is the most beautiful I've ever seen. So those are some of the comparison errors we see. If you're not sure how to create the comparison for a certain word, like beautiful, for example, uh, you can easily find that on the internet, or you can ask. Okay, now we're getting into the good stuff. Subordination. So we already discussed this. We're talking about subordinating clauses with our wabub conjunctions there, if, since, as, when, and so on. Um, I'm not gonna get into the adjective clauses so much today, uh, but I'd like to discuss those in another webinar sometime. So you might see overuse of subordinate clauses. In the middle of a traffic island, which is off the northeast corner of the park, there is a br brass plaque which marks the spot where the famous hanging tree once stood. So something just kind of seems off there. There's too many subordinate clauses kind of overwhelming the sentence. You can try in the middle of a traffic island off the northeast corner of the park. There's a brass plaque which marks the spot where the famous hanging tree once stood. You might also encounter illogical relationships or the incorrect use of the wabubs. While I discovered this old love letter folded neatly between two pages, I was browsing through a book at the library. But wouldn't it make more sense to say, while I was browsing through a book at the library yesterday, I discovered this old love letter folded neatly between two pages because of the meaning of while. or the most important information might be misplaced. It was extremely dry out, though the family decided to organize a wiener roast. This again comes back to what's 
what's most important, what should be in the independent clause. Although it was extremely dry out, the family decided to organize a wiener roast. And you could quibble about these. It really comes down to the writer's meaning, but you also want to make it logical so that your reader will understand. Okay, so sentence fragments are one of our most common, commonly found errors. Um, so this will be if one of these parts of the sentence is missing, uh, you might end up with a fragment. So some examples ran through the park. The subject is missing. He ran through the park. The green park. A complete thought is missing here. So how about the park is green? When I run. That's just a dependent clause. It needs to connect to I feel free. Running through the park. Running through the park, what happened? Running through the park requires a steady pace. So in that case, running through the park actually became the subject of the sentence. There's our verb and there's our object. So here's some more examples of sentence fragments. I sent Dahlia to the store, period, because we'd run out of milk, period. Well, watch out for a wabba at the beginning of the sentence. If it doesn't connect to an independent clause, it's a fragment. I sent Dahlia to the store because we'd run out of milk. You might find it with prepositional phrases. It came as a great relief to everyone. To everyone's not a complete sentence, so it needs to be joined. It came as a great relief to everyone. With gerund phrases, that's the ing phrases. She sat with the cell phone on her lap waiting for the familiar ring. Again, waiting for the familiar ring, that's not complete, doesn't have a subject and a verb. So we'll combine it with the previous. She sat with the cell phone on her lap, comma, waiting for the familiar ring. And you might see fragments like the, this one when you're reading novels. So fragments are much more acceptable in creative writing. Um, they should have a purpose, but they are acceptable. They're not acceptable in academic writing, so we still need to learn to uh, identify and fix them. And with a positives, information that is a description of something else in the sentence, the story takes place in Thompson, a small mining town in northern Manitoba. Sounds like we'll want to combine that with a comma to make it complete. So you can add the missing element. And you can read more about these later so we can go on to comma splices. So with a comma splice, you're joining two independent clauses into a compound sentence like we saw. But you put only a comma between them. That creates an error. I like lemon sorbet, comma, she prefers vanilla ice cream. That's not a strong enough punctuation mark to join two complete sentences. Just a comma. Commas are more going to be used with dependent clauses and phrases, but not two independent clauses. Unless we want to combine them with a comma and a fanboy. I like lemon sorbet, but she prefers vanilla ice cream. Or you could use a semicolon. I like lemon sorbet. She prefers vanilla ice cream. A lot of times when I see comma splices, I get the sense that the student wanted it to be a semicolon. That's why they were combining the two sentences into one because they're closely related. But the comma's not strong enough. So don't be afraid of the semicolon. Use that instead. And of course, you can also just separate them with a period. Run-ons are very similar, but now we have the attempted compound sentence without any punctuation. 
So we have our independent clauses, and when we join them into run-ons, I like lemon sorbet, she prefers vanilla ice cream. Whew. It, even that short sentence is hard to say. <laughs> There's no break. Um, I like lemon sorbet, but she prefers vanilla ice cream. Almost there with this one, but remember what punctuation we need before the fanboy. And our fixes are the same. A period, the comma fanboy, or a semicolon. So comma splices are actually a type of run-on. Um, where you've joined the two with a comma. Um, they can be a little bit clearer to understand than a full run on with no punctuation, um, but it's important to fix both and, and use these combinations, a period, a comma fanboy, or a semicolon. Oh, those aren't supposed to be there. Um, subject verb agreement. So we talked about the S and v, the V. Sometimes there can be an error there. So a subject can be singular, like I, one person, one thing, or plural, like we, one group of people, one group of things. The verb changes uh, depending on whether it's singular or plural. So the girl wears, with an S, glasses. The girls, plural, wear glasses. So watch out for the girl wear glasses or the girls wears glasses. So you might have noticed my hint here. In most cases, there should be one S and only one S between the two of them. Girl wears, there's the S. Girls wear, there's the S. So between the subject and the verb, this is just a rule of thumb. You want one S. That doesn't always happen when S is not what marks the plural, <laughs> but uh, a nice little rule of thumb there for you. Just ask yourself where you want the S. Are you talking about plural or singular? If you're talking about plural, the S goes with the noun, like the girls wear. So here are some common errors that we might find um, with non-count nouns. The news this morning were more depressing than ever. However, in English, it makes more sense to say the news this morning was more depressing than ever. With compound subjects like his friend and lover of 20 years have finally proposed to him. It can feel like you should say have because there's friend and lover but that's one person. So his friend and lover of 20 years has finally proposed to him. With correlative conjunctions, either John nor Fred have been invited to the wedding. So we've got two people there, um, but the conjunction in the middle actually makes it singular. Neither John nor Fred has been invited to the wedding. If it said, John and Fred have not been invited to the wedding, that would be different as well. Um, but this is talking about each of them separately, neither, neither of them, and that's one at a time. Or with collective nouns, like a steering committee, uh, when they're treated as a single unit. A steering committee have been formed to manage the heritage project. It's talking about the committee as a whole, not each person on it. So a steering committee has been formed to manage the heritage project. And we've got some more here, but I will allow you to go through those later with the slides that I sent. So we can also get to Pronoun reference agreement. So this is a different type of agreement. So we have a pronoun like he, she, they, or it. That's very vague. Who am I talking about? It has to refer back to something, uh, which is called the antecedent. It's another noun, uh, like the cat, the book, uh, the coach. 
So in the sentence, it needs to be clear which noun that pronoun, he, she, it, refers back to. And those two need to agree in number, singular, singular, plural, plural. Mark and Mike went to his favorite restaurant. So there's an ambiguity here. Whose favorite restaurant is it? So you could say Mark and Mike went to Mike's favorite restaurant or Mark and Mike went to their favorite restaurant. And now the pronoun uh, agrees here. There agrees with Mark and Mike. Here the pronoun was just replaced with the noun. Sometimes you have to just repeat the noun if it's clearer. Um, you might have uh, encountered that if you're writing and uh, writing an essay about um, like a research essay and you refer to the author. Well, you might need to give the name of the author again to make clear uh, who you're talking about instead of just saying he or she. So here's an example. Hamdi was helping an elderly man cross the road when he tripped and fell but we don't know who he refers to. We don't know which one tripped and fell. When he was helping an elderly man cross the road, Hamdi tripped and fell. Now it's clear that he is Hamdi. Sometimes the pronoun is too far away from the antecedent and it can get confusing. Um, here we've got the plague, even later an it, and the second it. So it's getting a little bit too far away. So a correction would be just to, like I was saying before, repeat the noun. That's okay to do that. Um, I would say clarity is more important. Now you wouldn't want it to just say the plague, the plague, the plague, the plague. Use a little it in there once in a while, <laughs> but um, make sure that it's clear. Um, sometimes the the noun is not even in the sentence. I had hoped Lila would call, and I waited all afternoon for it to ring. Didn't say that I waited all afternoon for the phone to ring. And there are some other ones here that you can review on your own. So we can talk about shifts. Um, so each sentence has its own. Um, Main subject, a voice like active or passive, um, tense, the verb tense, the time it's happening in, mood, um, you know, is it, uh, is it now or like in a tense or is it telling someone what to do um, and the pronoun reference. So you want to avoid shifts in each of these, just like we saw with parallelism and coordination, we want them to match. Shifts are allowed if, uh, like in certain situations, like this one, yesterday Mike went to the office, but today he works from home. Depending what time of day you say it, you might say worked if the workday is over. But if it's during the day, it does make sense to say present, even though the rest of the sentence was passed. Now, some errors. So here's an example of shifting tense when you don't want to. He picked up his mail and started to say something, but then leaves without a word. And we sometimes get this in um, like oral storytelling. Um, we do it in our own casual conversation from day to day, but we don't want to do it in our academic writing. So stick with the tense that you're using. He picked up his mail and started to say something, but then left without a word, all past tense. Here's the mood I mentioned. Enter your login information, press enter. Then you have to type in your password. So the first two are um, giving instruction. And the, the third one brings in the subject and the verb. Um, we want to make all of them just instructive. Enter your login information, press enter, then type in your password. Pronoun reference. Jan likes to holiday in remote places where you don't see another person for days on end. Jan likes to holiday in remote places where he doesn't see another person for days on end. Again, we all use this switching to you in our casual conversation, but we don't want to do that in our academic writing. 
How am I doing for time, Tunda? I was just trying to grab your attention, but you were busy presenting. Uh, 12 minutes. Perfect. Thank you. Actually, yeah, I, all I can see right now is my, my PowerPoint. So um, thank you. I appreciate that. We're getting to the end. We have two more that we'll cover today, and there are more. <laughs> but, um, you know, if you have any questions about these that we don't get to today or other errors that you've received feedback about, um, you're totally welcome to book an appointment or email us uh, and we can help you out more and, and discuss these in more detail. So the next two are to do with modifiers and a modifier is a word, phrase or clause that modifies, changes another element in the sentence. It describes it. So I just gave some examples here like blue. A color is a modifier. It's an adjective. It describes something where I rent. So now you can see phrases actually um, can be used to modify something like the apartment where I rent. Um, that many people believe. Even a clause can be a modifier. Um, the, um, the fact or the opinion <laughs> that many people believe it's modifying it, right? but a misplaced modifier isn't positioned properly in the sentence, uh, which can create confusion about what it's actually modifying. Um, sometimes these can get quite funny, actually. So if you find it in your own writing, you have to just kind of laugh. To fix it, place the modifier close to the word or the phrase that it modifies. Try to make it so it's not far away. Bring it closer, as close as you can. So we almost drove the whole way without stopping. In casual conversation, it kind of makes sense. But there is a question, there is an ambiguity. Did you drive almost the whole way without stopping? Or did you almost do something else? It's not quite in the right spot. Now with modifying phrases, I think this is actually a clause. Um, Anne was pleased to meet her great grandmother for the first time that she called Mimsy. Now it seems to be modifying the time, the first time. So let's put it closer to her great grandmother. Anne was pleased to meet for the first time the great grandmother she called Mimsy. Put them two, the two together, just like that. Also, you can see the two together up here. I want to bring them closer together. And with modifying clauses, when crossing the park, I met Mr. Jacobs walking his dog whose partner had just died. See, this is where it can get quite funny, although I've known dogs that had partners who died. So it is quite sad. Um, but pretty sure that in this case, we're talking about Mr. Jacobs whose partner had just died. So let's put those two close together. You can see how the modifier seems to modify whatever it's closest to. Another example, the cleaning committee cleared the garbage from the picnic site when it began to stink. This one I thought was funny because when I was just reviewing for today, I was actually thinking, does it mean it began to stink while they were clearing it? <laughs> no, it means when the garbage began to stink, that's when they cleaned it up. It's almost, you could say instead, because it began to stink, uh, they cleaned it up. Um, a squinting modifier happens when the modifier could be modifying what comes before or after. We told him often to practice. So did we tell him to practice often? Or do we often? tell him to practice. The director tried to realistically make a film about everyday life in the Yukon. Or is it that the film is realistic? So in this case, realistically seems to be modifying to make, but it should be modifying the film. 
Miriam had already reported the incident to the Occupational Health and Safety Officer, according to Angelo. Now, was it according to Angelo that she did this? Or did she report the incident according to what Angelo had said? It's actually according to Angelo, she's reported it. So always there's some a, a bit of ambiguity with misplaced modifiers. And that's the same with dangling modifiers. Dangling modifiers usually happen if the word or phrase that is being modified doesn't appear in the sentence. Um, so we want to rephrase the sentence to bring that uh, word or phrase back in. Being extremely hot, the artist called a glass blower must be very careful when handling it. We also have the pronoun reference error here because the, the noun is missing and it should say, because the molten glass is extremely hot, the artist called the glass blower must be very careful when handling it. The molten glass was missing from that sentence. So we didn't know what was extremely hot. After locking all the doors and windows, the house felt impenetrable. Now, again, we all say this in our conversation, but be careful of it in your academic writing because there could be a question about who locked all the doors and windows. After locking all the doors and windows, we felt the house was impenetrable. To get to where he is today, a lot of people had to be pushed out of his way. Or to get to where he is today, he had to push a lot of people out of his way. In the first one, it could sound like the lot of people got to where he is today. Because that's what's beside it. Better to put the actual modified noun beside it. While crossing the bridge, a sudden gust of wind blew his hat off. We don't know who he is until we say, while he was crossing the bridge, a sudden gust of wind blew his hat off. And presumably in the context of the paragraph, he has already been named. So we don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. 